joining us for this episode of the Austin Forum Upload, the podcast of the Austin Forum on technology and society. I am Jay Boisseau, the executive director and founder of the Austin Forum, and I'm very pleased to have with me here today, Nancy Giordano, a frequent presenter and speaker at the Austin Forum, but also in many, many other bigger contexts. She is a strategic futurist. And Nancy, why don't you tell our listeners a little bit about yourself? Hey, Jay, I'm so happy to be with you again. It's always great to have these conversations. You know, I walk through the world as a strategic futurist and a gatherer and a champion for a safe and thriving future. And so I really appreciate the work that you do to help further all of those goals ahead. Well, Nancy, our topic today, of course, is your role a strategic futurist. We want to give our listeners an idea of what that is how you get there, why it's important, and the kinds of successes it can bring. But I think we have to start with the definition. What is a strategic futurist? Uh, You know, for me, first of all, sort of what's a futurist? That's a whole other genre of work that probably people were less familiar with. So when you spend time with them, you realize there's a, a broad range, right? Some are forecasters, some really do a lot of scenario planning and are academic, some work inside organizations and try and do some of that work inside very specific groups. Um, I think of myself in the middle. I'm a strategic futurist. I help people envision the future that we want to have and create the steps that get us from here to there. So it's really a much more active role than it is one that's just uh, forecasting or imagining. That's the key distinction, and I'm glad you made that. There there are futurists who sort of share what they expect to happen, but you have an active role in helping develop strategies based on what uh, your analyses and insights think may happen. Great. So what kinds of companies and organizations need a strategic futurist? Well, because I think that anyone that is doing any kind of strategic planning, which would argue all companies, right? But really, the, the distinction here is that you're not doing strategic planning just in the context of assuming everything is going to stay exactly the way it is now. It is actually having a curiosity and an orientation to how those things are going to shift and how those will impact your business both negatively or positively, right? Are these headwinds or are these tailwinds as you look to the trajectories of the future? So I argue, you know, I mean, any organization, every organization needs to have this orientation. I, I knew you were going to say that. So my, my follow-up question to that, of course, is, you know, I work at a global technology giant by day, and we don't have anyone labeled a strategic futurist, but we certainly have people, one of whom you co-presented with a few months ago at a, in, at a sorry, a, a Zoom event, um, who's a strategist and a VP for strategy. And I believe that he would say, based on your definition, oh, well, I'm a strategic futurist in that regard then, because I, I think about the... Uh, technology trends, the customer trends, the economic and political and social trends, and try to marry these together into a strategy that I provide for my technology company. Do you think that most strategists in most companies are strategic futurists or not really strategic futurists, more of strategic planners? Yeah, I mean, my experience has been that they're more strategic planners. You know, Matt is a very, very savvy person. He's in that role. He's a very a senior person. I think probably the more senior you are, you know, even CEOs are more strategic than director level folks are. That's the nature of the job, right? So I do think that um, there are people who innately have this capacity, and that's usually how they end up in these roles. But even then, I see them still looking at the day-to-day context and not looking out further or assuming the only portion of it's going to change, right? They look at the consumer landscape or they look at your point at the advances in technology, but don't look at the social trends or the economic and poli- or ecolo- I'm sorry, economic and political shifts that are accompanying that. You know, have you ever watched a sci-fi show, Jay? And they assume they're going to have flying cars, but then they still have like some really analog way in which we go grocery shopping, (laughs) right? They they don't assume that these things are all going to advance simultaneously and they're all going to change. Even when we write scenarios, it's interesting. Like I'll focus on one area and forget that there'll be advances in two others. So it's really about being having a much more uh, well-rounded and uh, a much broader perspective about how these trajectories are going to impact what we're currently doing now. So compared to a strategist, you're more... Uh, you would argue a strategic futurist might be more well-rounded, looking at more different aspects of the future, trying to take a comprehensive and holistic view of the future before designing an active strategy around it. And compared to a strategist, uh, wait, sorry, just compared to a strategist, compared to a futurist, 
uh, you would say it's a more active role. It, it is not just futurist, but it is it, it marries that strategic planning and that future understanding and insight and a comprehensive future understanding and insight to develop an active plan for what might come next. Yeah, you know, I think what was interesting, the reason I ended up sort of self-defining this, that I had one of my sons when he was in middle school was doing a career analysis. You know, they go through that phase where they do all the testing and they come back as a forest ranger or ceramics engineer. And he came home one day and goes, you made up your job. And I'm like, I did, <laughs> right? And that's sort of the power of this. But I saw it as a need because what I saw in the organizations, even the most sophisticated, right? I was working at Shiat Day at the time. I mean, an amazing agency in LA. And what we saw is that someone would come in in March and talk to us about eating trends. And someone would come to us in May and talk about technology trends. And someone would come to us in July and talk about the you know, lifestyle of demographic trends. And no one hooked all that information together. It was really about if you look at all of these things, and it's actually my work is I usually don't use the word trends. I really use shifts. What are the big shifts, right? What does the future need and expect of us? And what are we in a unique position to create and contribute to that? That's really my strategic, if you will, orienting compass. And so how far out do you want to look and see about what does the future need and expect from us? IKEA, we interviewed one of their um, strategic futurists, and they you know, have an orientation 400 years out, and then they backcast the work that they want to do. Imagine that if you had an orientation that took you that far out. Years. Yeah, multiple generations, right? Five or six generations into the future, what will the world look like? And how can we make sure that we're orienting to delivering what we want? So I just think that it's a very useful perspective, depending even if you look out, 30 years, if you look out 50 years, if you look out whatever, it's more than three months. Let's put it that way. It's more than a quarter ahead. Well, as I think about people writing on parchment and using muskets to hunt their food 400 years ago, it's a little hard for me to imagine what it might be like 400 years from now, but I'm, I'm glad they have that long range look and I'm glad they're, they're paying attention to that. So let me ask you a follow-up question to this. You mentioned Ikea. Um, how does one become a futurist and what percentage of companies would you say have futurists and how could they develop futurists or hire futurists? So I've realized I've now merged three questions into one, but what I'm really getting at here is how do people take advantage of this role? And are, are, are many companies doing it? Are they growing their own? Are they hiring consultants? What, what is the current state of the job, strategic futurist, and how can more people get into it and more companies take advantage of it? Uh, fabulous question. I probably don't have any empiric answers to that. So I don't know what percentage. I don't know if you like if you went to LinkedIn right now and look for open jobs for strategic futurists. It's actually really, really rare that combination of words is put together. I'm seeing it crop up a bit more here and there. Um, usually inside organizations, there are people who are taking on that role inside. We've got a good friend, Sarah Devonzo, who does it for a big uh, uh, beauty and cosmetics company. There's someone else who's doing it at Dolby. Like there are some interesting you know, people who are leading this work inside organizations, probably hopefully the most forward thinking versions that are really trying to think again about the merging of technology and society and their products and services and wanting to make sure that they stay relevant. Um, I'm just going to back up for a second and say one of the stats that I use often when I talk to groups about why this is so important is BCG did a study at the beginning of uh, 2020. It, came, it was thriving in the 2020s and it came out in January 2020, right before the whole like snow globe of our planet to shook. Uh, but they forecast that one out of three public companies would cease to exist in its current form over the next five years. And that rate of change was much faster than it's been over the last 30 years. So let's just hold that for a second. You can't stay static and continue to survive, right? Continue to be successful. Everything is in giant transition right now. So the companies that are really grokking that, who understand that, are the ones who are employing this kind of capacity more so than others are. So the question is about who makes, you know, what does it make to be a good strategic futurist? And I just, it starts with curiosity. Every tech company will tell you curiosity, 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 and not just individually, but also inside an organization, like how does the organization incentivize curiosity, right? There was a study that was done, a report that came out in Harvard Business Review in December 2019, in which they interviewed a bunch of managers and like, yeah, we want people to be curious, but not too curious because then they're going to run amok. And that's the mindset that we need to change, right? Because you don't want a bunch of yeah. frustrated people who have ideas and don't know what to do with them, but you do want to have ways in which you can channel and both encourage and channel that curiosity. So I'd say that's the, the, the primary one. Um, and then the second is an ability to synthesize that information. So again, like I said, I was frustrated that I could see that the eating trends was related to technology, was related to lifestyles, but nobody was hooking that information together back in the day. I think we're doing a better job of that now, but I don't think we really have enough of a holistic point of view on it. And so it's ability to see a system or to see 
how these interlocking uh, forces are, are creating, again, opportunities or threats moving ahead. So the, the sort of the requisite skills of a person might be curiosity, number one, and then the kind of intelligence. And there are many kinds of intelligence, and we all know people that are fabulous at, at X or Y or Z, and maybe not so much at A or B or C. And that's that's great. We're all different. And we all uh, have different innate abilities and develop them differently. But you're saying the kind of intelligence that, that enables you to synthesize from different factors, social, political, I'm assuming, technical, economic, things like that, that kind of comprehensive synthesis, sort of systems way of looking at things, but it's not just systems in one domain. It's the whole system and all the factors. Yeah. And, and I think, again, I, you know, after I've given keynote talks, it's always interesting to see who comes up to me and I become kind of the patron saint for them because they, there are these people inside organizations that nobody else understands and they feel like they try and say these to their coworkers and nobody gets it. They always want them to focus narrowly on a particular task or a particular role. And they get very excited that they meet somebody who's able to have this breadth of yeah. insight or able to hook these things together and see you know, what that produces. And uh, they don't feel like, again, they're necessarily acknowledged well inside their organizations. And so I think uh, my guess is 10 to 20% of people inside organizations are naturally this kind of thinker. And they just don't often have enough um, ability to connect with others or enough platform to share that with other people with the same you know, enthusiasm that they have it with. Um, there's also an interesting thing. There's an organizational um, development expert, David Tao, T-O-W, I think, who wrote a really interesting piece in World Future Society magazine many, many years ago about how the world was going to need more and more synthesizers. And his uh, hypothesis was that as we have more and more information, we get more and more and more specific. And as we get more and more specific, we create silos. When we create silos, then we don't have somebody who's able to connect the dots across them. So imagine again that, you know, I want to be a doctor, for uh, you know, cancer, for liquid tumors, for children under 13. Like you have not the kind of expertise that you could have now. And somebody else can do the same thing in orthopedics. But now all of a sudden a child presents with something that's going on their leg and everyone's just focused only on their one little area, not thinking about how it could be potentially either connected to or another thing. So you need people who can look across. And what they found is that teams that naturally had this kind of curious bridge builder actually had much more successful outcomes than teams that didn't. But what was interesting to Bruce is why, so it was Bruce Tao, um, why people would do that when they weren't incentivized to do that inside their organizations. Most people shut them down and say, why are you asking all these questions, right? This isn't, has nothing to do with the work we're doing right now. And so the question is, how can we build capacity again inside our organizations to have this 10 to 20% have more freedom to be able to connect the dots for everybody more effectively? And, and so you mentioned a, you know an estimated rough percentage of people in an organization that you think might have that sort of mindset as opposed to a more focused engineering mindset or a more marketing mindset, et cetera. But what percentage of companies do you think really allow themselves to have somebody flourish in that role and maybe even name it as such as a strategic futurist? Um, again, I think it's a very small group. I mean, Dave, Bruce, I keep saying David, Bruce estimated only 5% inside organizations or in society had that capacity. I think that's way too low. I do think it's closer to 10 to 20%. Uh, so then the question is how many organizations are led that way versus how many organizations make room for that versus some organizations dismiss it altogether. My um, sense was that, you know, if I could just turn people onto the future, like, oh, they just haven't paid attention to it. Let me just open the blinders and get them excited about this. You know, years ago, you know, we did this event on the seven most disruptive technologies uh, with GigaOM. And I was like, oh my God, people just don't know all these things that are going to happen. Let me go and like tell them. And what you mm -hmm. found is that most just have no capacity to be able to absorb and respond to new information. They just shut it out. And that was part of what got led to my thinking now that it's less about understanding the future than it is about building the capacity to be able to sense and respond to change more effectively. How do we build those capacities? What's getting in the way of doing that? So you've been looking at this for a while, obviously, and thinking about this deeply. Have you noticed that um, you've, you've noticed some barriers to this? Have you noticed people becoming more accepting of this over the last, say, three to five years? That's question number one. And then a related question is, have you noticed an increasing importance for having this? Because as we all know, knowledge is growing exponentially, technology is growing exponentially. Things are changing now, not over the course of generations or over the course of one generation, uh, but they're changing over the course of single digit numbers of years. We're seeing you know, technology that 
what would have seemed like magic 20 years ago. Now we dispose of it, you know, when we get the new iPhone 14 or whatever. So we're, we're really in our own lifetimes, we're seeing capabilities be born, change the way we live, and sometimes die and be replaced by others. So are you seeing the, the need for strategic futurists growing in this because of this relationship to exponential growth of knowledge and technology capability? Well, you see me like you, know, you and I are able to see each other. The audience can't, but right now I'm nodding my head vigorously as you say all that, right? Because of, uh, of course, I think that the uh, yes, of course, the need has been there and continues to become more and more and more present. I think the difference was prior to the pandemic, we were constantly told that a either that will never happen, or even if we tried to paint the picture, too expensive, too difficult, too disruptive, too, 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 whatever, for people to actually jump in and actually make some of the changes that we suggested that they'd be ready for. The companies that did, or even the school districts who did, right, were much better prepared than the ones who put their head in the sand the whole entire time. And so I think the recognition of that has now perked people up to be more curious about it. They recognize something can come out of nowhere. They recognize that, you know, Bill Gates did try and warn us of the pandemic. We should have listened more. Um, so how can we be better prepared? I think the thing that's going to shift it now is the, you know, a potential recession or recessionary fears that are having people pull back and retrench now to just be able to survive at the moment will work against those who've been, you know, had this curiosity and this openness and excitement about where they were going will now be, um, turn that off, unfortunately, I think again. Okay, when that response, including the mention of the schools, but that, that overall response leads right into my next question, which is, can you share an example that our listeners can get their teeth into of where you brought a strategic futurist way of thinking into an organization or company and help them think differently, overcome something, achieve something uh, newer or newer, better than they had before? A I mean, success. I yeah, I mean, you know, there, there are companies on the externally that we champion, like Microsoft, I think does a really good job of really thinking about things in a much broader and bigger context. Even things like paying contract workers the same or ensuring that they would get similar benefits to full-time workers. That's a really thoughtful perspective about how to run a company that isn't just about how to make sure that we go ship the next you know, thing that we need to go ship. They're really looking at it more holistically. They're putting mindfulness into their teams, uh, applications, right? They're really thinking about the, the sort of a much bigger picture. So I think there's somebody in there who's uh, doing a great job of, of guiding them. And actually one of my favorite speaking gigs is going to be to Microsoft brand managers right before the pandemic. And that was one that got canceled that never got rebooked, which is such a bummer. Uh, but I'm a big champion of the way that they think. The ones that we purposely helped, you know, Nestle Frozen Foods was probably my favorite example. This is many years ago. But what we saw is coming out of the 2008 recession, everyone thought they could just gin up their old operating system and didn't realize that the world had really fundamentally changed, right? We had mobile social revolution that happened at that same time. People came up, they were able to exchange information differently. They were much more focused on values than they had been before, not just value, but values. Uh, and so there was a whole new way in which we needed to go to market and 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 connect with people. Um, and the companies, again, that, that sort of perked up to that. One of them was Nestle. They saw the share of frozen food sales continue to go down. They saw that the retail uh, experiences that were increasing or that were growing and had higher profit margins were the healthier ones, like Whole Foods and Sprouts. And none of their products were available in those stores because people thought that they weren't healthy. So we put together this whole uh, workshop and then it led into a strategic engagement with them for a few months to really understand how things had changed so dramatically in their world, right? There was the income bifurcation that had happened. So you could have people who could spend $7 if people could spend $2, but nobody really was cared about spending four or $5 in the middle anymore. So there were a whole bunch of factors that we put together and showed that it was that they all were linked together. So there was economic shifts that had happened. There were against the social shifts in the terms of way that we coordinate with one another. There was an obesity uh, epidemic that was continuing to, you know, unfortunately we still haven't nailed it, but, you know, was frightening people and they were getting all kinds of nutritional advice now from all kinds of ways that they hadn't before. So there are all these things that we started thinking about that, you know, were impacting brands and how they couldn't just keep building the way that they did. So partly it was futurism and partly it was much more holistic strategy. It went from how we uh, named things on the campus. It, uh, we, we worked with them in this really dynamic way in which we made sure that even like in meetings, we didn't have food that got thrown out. Like we had packaged food that could be reused, like a banana versus chopped fruit salad, right? Because I'm like, if we're going to really talk about sustainability, like how do we live it? And how do we ensure that our plants are actually able to make smaller 
um, batches of things so we can test things more effectively, right? We can do a gluten-free offering. We can do something with kale. It doesn't have to sell hundred million. Like how do we become much more nimble with the work that we do so we can test and respond? Because that's really one of the key capacities, Jay. It's not so much that we know, but that we build the capacity again to be able to sense, test, respond, iterate, do it again, right? That's really the key to being able to do this work. So Nestle really um, changed the way they did their whole manufacturing system. They changed everything in order to be able to be a much more responsive player. Wow, that, that, that that's a great answer there towards the end for my final question about recommendation. But before I get to that one, um, I just wanted to ask, have you had much luck in convincing companies to hire or develop strategic futurists? Um, you know, I actually got frustrated with it at some point. I just felt like, you know, we kept trying to shift analog company or not analog, but like iconic, older, I guess, mm-hmm. like non-tech companies, however you want to call, you know, a bunch of food and beverage companies in particular, um, to move to this new way of thinking. And they were really struggling. You know, they just had such a difficult time being able to accept that the world was shifting around them. You know, at one point I went to an event and I saw the CEO, I think it was from Kraft Mondelez, sitting in his chair, like almost like shrunken in talking about how they just lost a billion dollars, you know? And I was like, the only person who's surprised by that is you. The world around you has changed, but we don't want processed food and we don't want, uh, you know, things to be overpackaged and we don't want things to be sold in a certain way. And they just hadn't responded. We just saw that Revlon has filed for bankruptcy, right? So there are companies that are just not grokking it. And the ones that do, um, I think are opening this, uh, capacity. I think I've gone off track here in terms of what you were asking, but I just, I'm, I'm an evangelist for the fact that um, if you don't do it, the tech companies are like, I shifted actually from this whole world of, of trying to convince companies that this was important and getting so much backlash against it to going to help build an artificial intelligence company. And, in, you know, seven years ago, I just decided, let's go just join the companies that are building the future instead of trying to be with the ones that are trying to save the future. Um, and now I've come back around. And realize that there is a lot of you know equity and resources and amazing potential for these companies that are now starting to lean into and realize that they have a much bigger role. Chanel Cosmetics, beautiful to see what they're doing in terms of they've got an atelier, a little um, what do you call it, test store in Soho. They're doing services. They're trying to figure out how to bring technology much more into their stores. Like it's really fun to see when organizations actually open up and let this new world um, shape their relevance and shape what they do with greater. Uh, purpose and passion. It, it's been fun for me to hear you uh, throw in these examples throughout this podcast of schools, Microsoft, Chanel, Ikea. I mean, just very different yes, examples. <laughs> but the fact is, all of them exist today and want to exist tomorrow. So if they want to exist tomorrow and the day after tomorrow, understanding rapid rates of change, the confluence of many different factors, hopefully you'll have even more luck in the future convincing places to hire strategic strategic, um, futurists because if nothing else, the pandemic, the war in Ukraine, we're seeing a lot of perturbations to uh, global supply chains, to capacity and supplies of materials, et cetera. So, Better to really think about the future and the various trends. And of course, you can never predict it perfectly, but. Um, Again, I'm not trying to predict it. I'll, I'll I, I, yeah. I, I'm actually, I'm out, I, I don't think it's, I mean, other than Ray Kurzweil, who's one of the best predictors. Um, I don't know that there's many of us who do that, but again, I'm looking at the forces. So really my work right now is focused on going inside organizations and talking about the forces that are shaping the future and showing them how that's playing out and then explaining to them that this that creates the capacity or the need, right? Again, what does the future need and expect? And we lay out, what does the future need and expect? And then we look at what we're in a unique position again to create and contribute to that. And I keep saying it again, as an individual, as a team, as an organization, as an industry, as a nation. And now we're working on a project that has to do with North America. What would North America's you know, role be in the, the, the global uh, community of which we are a part, uh, which is really exciting to think about how to answer that question that way. So it all just depends on stepping into it and being curious enough to ask the question, right? What does the future need to expect from me? Yeah, I, I, and I love the way you phrased that and how you, what does the future expect from me? What What is the future we want to see happen to? What do we envision? Not just what may happen if we don't do anything, but what is the future we want to create uh, in the face of all of these trends? And how, what is the one we should create? And then being very active participant in that future. So, so I, I, I love all of this. This, well, we're in a unique time. I was going to say one thing and just say, we're at this amazingly unique time where there is this huge inflection. You know, I talk about the fact that I spend a lot of time with the people who are building the future. You spend a lot of time with the people who are building the future. When you ask them how far along we are into this next big transition, often we hear 1%. 
we're early, early days into this you know, transition that we're heading into. And so we get to be the people who design it. We have some really big choices to make about how we want this to look. We get to design what we want it to look like. That to me is an amazing moment in time to be in as we rethink and reimagine almost every single industry around us in the next few you know, years and decades to come. Well, now I'm going to ask you the final question that I ask all of our interviewees, which is what's your biggest recommendation for our listeners? And keep in mind, some may be people that are thinking about this as a career path. Many are decision makers in their companies or organizations and are thinking about how to make their own companies or organizations grow, be more sustainable, be more resilient, et cetera. So you may have two takeaway points here for wannabes and for leaders that uh, want to hire those uh, future I mean, future should be futurists. <laughs> futures. I, I think at the end of the day, really, again, it goes back to just being open and thinking about what if. You know, I'm told often that this will never, ever happen. And my point is, what if, right? I was told that a CEO would never tweet, Nancy. Here we are, right? Um, I was told by you know, people in the medical profession, AI will never, ever replace a doctor. Who knows? So I would just say really be in this place of what if and be really open to the conversations. Look, look, read the things outside of your purview. Someone asked me in the talk uh, earlier this week about, you know, she's a working mom. She's got two small children. How can she possibly keep up with all this? And one of the interesting things about this algorithmic world that we're in is when you start to question, like ask for interesting information in your search bar, the algorithm comes and feeds you back over and over again, all kinds of stuff. Like it starts to go, oh, she's curious about this. And oh, she's curious about that. Like let the engine work for you and start to bring you things that you're curious about and interested in. And then you start to connect the dots. You start to go, oh, I just read this thing over here. And then I just saw this piece over here. And we just had a breakthrough with something over there. And you start to become more confident in your understanding of how things work. And once you have that confidence, you get more and more curious, right? I think the reason we often don't want to sense change is we don't have the confidence to respond to it. If we build more capacity to know that we can respond, then we get more excited about being able to sense it. Does that make sense? It does. That is a great takeaway for our listeners. Nancy, thank you so much for joining us. I, I know I call on you fairly regularly for the Austin Forum, and you can count on that increasing as we try to plan our own future for the Austin Forum. And as a new hybrid organization that has multiple modes of programming and recognizing our role in helping people try to keep up with change and synthesize different technologies and different factors into their own companies and orgs. So you, you encapsulated all of that beautifully today. Thank you very much. Thank you so much for everything you do, Jay. I'm always here. And we will be back with a new episode next week. Thank you to our listeners and uh, have a great week. Thanks for listening to the Austin Forum Upload. You can listen to additional episodes and check out a schedule of our monthly in-person events at austinforum.org. The Upload is a production of the Austin Forum on Technology and Society, a nonprofit organization here in Austin, Texas. <laughs>